Phil Newton, Dr. Phil Newton, has set records for his undersea diving skills. His record dives have landed him in prestigious magazines and on the cover of National Geographic. Hollywood producers and government officials call him for undersea advice, and he and his design team create submersibles to be reckoned with and respected. He invented the newt suit and the exosuit. He is a mariner who taught himself to navigate the ocean. It is my pleasure to welcome Phil Newton to Studio 4 to tell us more. Dr. Phil Newton, I should say, because you've got a bunch of those PhDs. Mm -hmm. Honorary? Yes, honorary, like, like Colonel Sanders. You mm. know, I'm that kind of a doctor. You, know, so. <laughs> you can't take my appendix out. No, I can't. I'm sorry. Okay, that's good. But uh, I know you quit uh, school in grade 11. Yes, absolutely. It, um, it was kind of... Uh, High school was a bit boring, but uh, the lure of, of going out and, uh, and diving, commercial diving and salvage work and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. and running my own business was just too great for me by that time. Smart move. Mm -hmm. Who taught you to dive? Um, it was actually a, uh, a cop who really? taught me to dive. Yeah, a fellow, Constable Maloney, Basil Maloney, who was the head of the Identification Bureau of Vancouver City Police. And uh, they'd formed a club, uh, he and a couple of other guys, uh, had formed a club in the 19, late 1940s called the Vancouver Skin Divers. And I was their youngest member. So uh, they taught so, me to dive. What a great cop name, Basil Maloney. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Everybody called him Pat. You know, so. <laughs> oh, Pat Maloney. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I have no idea why they called him Pat, because his name was Basil. You know, but. Right. But there you go. Uh, so that started that. And then um, this inventing gene you have. As a little kid, were you tinkering around? Oh, very much so. I've building, uh, drawing, tinker mostly. toys, tinker drawing, toys, but drawing, drawing. All, all these, all these things were in my mind. Um, I could put on paper, and it was amazing because once they're on paper, and I could see what they might look like, well, mm -hmm. then of course I had to build them, and so that mm -hmm. was the start of it all. So, does something like an exosuit start with a sketch? Everything starts with a sketch, and usually on the back of a brown paper bag or a napkin or a serviette or something, but. It all starts with that. I look back on some of those uh, early sketches, and it's surprising how the finished product turned out to be very close mm. to the original sketch. Mm. An exosuit. If I got into an exosuit, do I know enough to... Uh, to make go, it, to operate it? <laughs> to operate it, or is it complex? It's, no, it's not complex at all. The, uh, there's a life support system inside. It has two days of life support, so in case you get you know, your foot caught in a clam or something, uh, mm. you've got a lot of time mm -hmm. to think about it. Um, the exosuit is a like exoskeleton on a crab, so it's a, a pressure suit. It's a, a body armor that you wear, very similar to iron suit or hard suit or the things that you see mm -hmm. on TV. The kids look at the kids love it because they look at it and say, my God, it's a transformer come to mm -hmm. life. You know? But what it does is it protects you against pressure. So you can walk around the bottom of the ocean at a thousand feet all day long and you have no effect of pressure. You've got the same pressure there that you and I are right now. Right. And so it means you can go down to 1,000 feet in about five minutes instead of the 24 hours it normally takes to acclimatize a diver to it. And uh, you can stay there all day and come back up in five minutes. And what would you see? Oh, my goodness. Uh, my goodness. See, I've never dived. <clears throat> I'm a bad swimmer, not a good swimmer, and so I sink a lot. <laughs> But I've never well, dived, you so take me you to the owe it to bottom of the sea well, in the exosuit. What you normally see in shallow water here and in other parts of the world is this lush you know, growth mm -hmm. of life, but you have never seen anything like the deep water because in the deep ocean, all the life is in the water column, not on the seafloor. So as you pass through, the, as you go deeper and deeper, the, the life starts to become more abundant mm -hmm. and more and more abundant until finally you're, you're falling through this this sky of, of critters, this crystalline critters, all these siphonophores and tenophores, and when you go deep, of course, it's pitch black, it's dark. So all these things are emitting light, and they're signaling, and they look mm. like, looks like a giant, looks like something out of the 60s and 70s, I'm you know. sure. A giant you remember psychedelic that. show, yes, I do. Uh, yeah. Surreal. Yeah, it really, really. is. Really. Uh -huh. How far down can you go in an exosuit? Uh, about a thousand feet. That's it? Yeah. Why only a thousand well, feet? Well, because we, we could make a deeper one, but if you go deeper, uh, you have to make the hull thicker. Um, you have to, uh, it's, it's more difficult to handle, it weighs more, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, and it costs more to build. So, a thousand feet seems to be a right, nice round number, and that's about as deep as most man made objects go bridges, docks, dams, cables, all those sorts right. of things. Those are things we work on. So, so, if your director friend Jim Cameron called you up and said, I'd like to buy an exosuit, he has. 
He probably well, he wouldn't has. call me up. He was at the shop, and he saw the uh, Exosuit 1, which was just unveiled a month or so ago. This was, um, oh gosh, uh, last year. And we were starting on production, and he said, I want one. And I said, okay, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. set, give us a deposit, and we'll, we'll build one. He said, oh, no, no. He said, I want to see one work first. And then, you know, it's been mm -hmm. a long time, because I've been working on this particular design for a very long time. We, uh, we built a suit called the Newt Suit many years ago. I remember. Yeah, and so that was a very successful suit. Same principle. Uh, I patented the, the rotary joints on it and everything. And, but that was about 25 years ago. So we've supplied them to navies all over the world, and they're used for submarine rescue and first on scene. But in using these suits for 25 years, you learn a lot of things you should have done or of could course. have done. Of course, every so, inventor does. Yes, exactly. So the exosuit is just the next generation. The next step is lighter. Yes, much Gain lighter. A, it's lighter, lighter, cheaper, better, you know, mm. it's uh, more flexible, allows you to do things you couldn't do in the nude suit. Uh, and of course with the, the tremendous change in technology, I mean the yes. digital revolution, I mean, we've got things that are in the in the nude suit that are this big, they're this big in the EXO because the miniaturization of all this stuff, all the uh, all the electronics, there's uh, the suit is literally controlled electronically, the life support, the atmospheric monitoring, all that sort of stuff. Mm. So, so when James Cameron comes to you, buys an exosuit, mm -hmm. uh, what did it cost him? Uh, about a half a million bucks. Half a million bucks. Mm -hmm. Well, he's a famous Hollywood director. Yes, he is. Because he's got half a million and bucks. He certainly has. And he's not a pie-in-the-sky explorer, is he? No, not at all. You know, people have the idea that Jim Cameron is a kind of a wealthy dilettante who, mm -hmm. you know, built made himself Titanic. a... Yeah, he made Titanic, and he wants to go to the bottom of the ocean to set records and all this, mm -hmm. and nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, James Cameron is a frustrated undersea technologist. He loves the deep ocean. He, uh, that's why a lot of the stuff uh, he did with Titanic and everything, mm -hmm. this is groundbreaking stuff in undersea technology. So it's a great movie, it made a hell of a lot of money for a lot of people, but realistically, uh, from our standpoint, we're saying, wow, the stuff that he used to do this is groundbreaking stuff. Yeah. I and mean, this will be used for science, it'll be used for military, mm -hmm. be used for commercial use, etc. How did you meet him? Uh, on the movie The Abyss, uh, I was the senior um, technical consultant and we supplied all the submersibles for the movie, mm -hmm. so it's gotten to be quite a cult movie now. But at the time, uh, I went down to Fox and uh, met with him and he was writing furiously as I was answering questions about, he wanted the jargon of commercial divers, you know, so he was, every time, it was a couple of us uh, divers mm -hmm. were there and he said, well, talk as though you were talking about a job, so we were talking about this non-existent job and actually ribbing him, we were, you know, putting him on quite a bit and he's oh, writing all this stuff right. down. Finally, I got a little nervous. And, Jim, you know, a lot of the stuff is just a joke. It's just so, not know, true. It's, so, diver lingo. Yeah, well, like sphincter factor. That. You know, so. I think I know what that means. Exactly. You're terrified. Yeah, <laughs> so it, the degree of terrification. So, the sphincter mm -hmm. factor of 10 is as high as it gets. It is. So, you'd say, so what is this? And so, it's, a, it's about an 8. It's so an that's, 8. So, that's not a pretty girl. That is, that <laughs> you know, is that's a bad job. That's a bad uh, dive. Or not a bad dive necessarily, but a scary dive. What yeah. is a scary dive? To you, um, one that you feel nervous so about, and uh, you know the the most courageous d commercial divers are the ones that say no. It's so mm -hmm. hard to say no because right. you know you're being paid to do this. It's a gig. You've got all these people waiting for it. It's important. You know everybody's looking at their watch, saying, "Get this sure. done so we can go on." And you feel like saying, "I don't feel good about mm. this." And to say that, say, I'm not going to do this, Right. that takes a tremendous amount of courage. You bet. Trust your gut. You'll talk to any mountain climber who has lived, and they will not make the climb, or they'll stay in mm -hmm. camp, or stay at base until the weather's right. You yeah. talk to any pilot, mm -hmm. as you know, you don't beat the weather in a small aircraft. You simply don't. Well, a scary dive, to answer your question, is one where you do it anyhow even when you feel you shouldn't, mm. and that just scares the hell out of you. Like on a rescue or what? Well, a rescue or something that, uh, you know, you're just sort of um, mm. in the middle on saying, oh, I really, I don't know about this one, but uh, what the hell, mm -hmm. I'll do it. And that's the ones that scare you. Sure. Uh, alone or with a buddy? Uh, well, commercial dog was always alone. Always alone? Sure. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. See, I'd like a buddy down there. Well, we have uh, I guess you have a buddy up top. Oh, yeah, you've got the surface communication, mm -hmm. you've got all of that sort of stuff. But, um, yeah, you're by yourself down there, no question. That isolation, that sense of isolation. That's kind of peaceful. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when, it, when they're moving cranes and all these things are going on, 
um, you know, you sort of sit there and you have time to look around. Mm -hmm. It's almost like smell the roses, but in this case, watch the fish. And what a great place to, to earn your living. Right. Now, uh, back to Jim Cameron, or uh, James Cameron. Uh, he went into the Mariana Trench. Yes, he did. Made entertainment tonight he on did. that one. Yeah. What is the Mariana Trench? By Guam, where is it? It's, it's, yeah, it's just it's not far from Guam. It's the deepest place in the world. So it's the deepest feature on Earth, the deepest trench. So it's about seven miles deep. 120 so, times deeper, I read, yes. than the Grand Canyon. Oh, yeah, it's much deeper. Well, I'll give you some perspective. Um, it's almost exactly as deep as Mount Everest is high. Whoa. You know, so it's a long way down. Mm -hmm. So the uh, seven miles down, there. Well, you know, Cameron and I were talking about this, and I said, so what happens uh, if you have a problem? He said, well, you know what happens. There's no cavalry. No one's going to come and rescue. There is no vehicle that can come and rescue. And I said, yeah, I know. So how do you feel about that? And he said, hey, hey. That, that's the way it is. It's one of those you only live once. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. If you don't live, yeah. you die under the sea that but, you love? Or you know, What he was really trying to do, or really or has done, mm -hmm. is uh, take all of the latest um, high-def videos and the wonderful lenses that are available now, all this sort of stuff, down to the very bottom of the ocean, and starting at the bottom, open up the deep ocean. So mm -hmm. open up the deep ocean for science, for exploration, mm -hmm. and it's easy to work back, you know, so when you go that deep. But mind you, he's not the first one to do it. Uh, Don Walsh, you know, a friend of mine, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I mean old in both senses, yes. um, was there in, the, in 1960. He 1960? And, uh, yeah, he and in Jacques Picard went down on the Trieste. Equipment that wasn't Oh, it was incredibly that fancy. different. No, so the Trieste was the size of, of two buses, you know, because underneath it was this little gondola, this little steel ball where these two guys were inside, and all the rest of it was gasoline. A huge gasoline tank they used for buoyancy because Great. The, everything else would just collapse. You know they couldn't go that yeah. deep. So what Jim did, part of the great stuff that he pulled off, was developing a buoyancy system made of uh, microspheres, uh, syntactic foam they call it, and we use that normally. But no one has ever built foam that went that deep, and so he's done it successfully. So he built a, a machine that was uh, like a Volkswagen compared to two full-size city buses. Hmm. And he did say on the TV that it's really dark down there, mm -hmm. and it's isolating, obviously. It would be seven miles under the sea. It's a long way down. Mm -hmm. I wonder how it changed him. I've talked to many astronauts over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, Roberta Bond are on down or on up. And once they leave Earth, they have some profound, profound experiences. Sometimes life-changing, sometimes yeah. not. I think it's the same uh, on your very deep dives, you know, thousands mm -hmm. of feet. Uh, you do feel a separation, you know, from uh, from the day to day, from the norm, and uh, and we've trained a lot of astronauts. We've trained about 40 astronauts. Our team is uh, that's part of the stuff we do is teach astronauts to operate our subs and suits, and they use them as analog um, simulators for space. We just finished a big contract um, with NASA in November, where we we're going out and uh, on artificial asteroids. So we had the two uh, astronauts flying our little subs, little deep workers, right? And uh, they were they were carrying another astronaut, astronaut on the end of a pole with a foot restraint they used on the Canada arm, and uh, he, in scuba gear, and flying him to a fake asteroid on the seafloor that they'd set up. And the idea is for to demonstrate that he could be taken to this thing with a lunar with a lander, and right. then drill into it, and then anchor his little. Um, because okay, this is an asteroid that sunk, not one no, no, falling no, out of the sky. This, fake, is, this a, is a fake asteroid. Fake asteroid, okay, but it's. it's uh, they're going to the asteroids. That's the next big thing. That's up what, there? Yeah. Or ones that have landed? No, no, no. Up there. Up there? Yes. Oh, really? So these are called uh, NIAs, near Earth asteroids. And uh, that's the next big, big move. The big program for NASA and the Canadian Space Agency is going to these asteroids. Interesting. And there's and got to be a reason why. We'll take a break when we come back. There's a reason they're going for asteroids. Absolutely. Probably. Uh, Phil Newton, our guest, he is the head of Anuco Research and Can Dive and Cal Dive and all of the dives. We'll come back. <laughs> 